Hey folks, it's Dr. Gilchrist, and kind of as promised, uh, I thought it would be useful to help and kind of walk you through a couple of snippy exercises that are not a part of your homework assignment, but might better help you understand uh, some of the phenomena that we are going to start talking about next week. So one of the very first uh, phenomena that we are going to talk about is something known as the blocking effect. And we'll kind of talk about what the blocking effect is and how it works. So uh, the blocking effect is basically the result of something called compound cognition, or not compound cognition, compound conditioning. And it's basically the idea that we are combining multiple stimuli together to uh, basically see uh, what the rat will be conditioned to and what the rat will not be conditioned to. Um, so what we are going to do uh, we are going to start um, by doing a um, compound conditioning effect, and then I am going to follow that up with a blocking effect. So uh, first of all, what we're going to do is we are going to do uh, compound conditioning, and like I said, we will follow that up with blocking so that you get a better idea of how this works. So. Here's how we're going to do this. We're going to start with the new Sniffy file, which I have. I'm going to go ahead and do a save as. So we are going to call this compound conditioning. Okay. So we call this compound conditioning. Here is what we are going to do. We are going to design a classical conditioning experiment. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to do five minutes between trials. We're going to present each trial type 10 times. And so here's what we're going to do. We're going to do two stimuli together. So we are going to do a medium intensity light and a medium intensity tone for our first stimulus. For our second stimulus, we are going to use a medium intensity shock. So this is the very first stage. You get 10 trials of a light and a tone together paired with a shock. So now that we've done this, we're gonna create a new stage. So now we're gonna do stage two. Uh, we have uh, five minutes between trials. Um, and for e present each trial type, this time we're just going to do one. Um, so in this case, in the first stimulus, we are only going to select the medium intensity light. So we're not pairing the tone here. And the light is going to be presented with nothing. So we've done 10 trials in stage one with a light and a tone paired with a shock. Uh, for stage two, we are only presenting a trial in which a light is presented with nothing. So hopefully the rat kind of learns that it is the tone that is responsible for the shock and not the light. So now we've done that. Um, so here's what we are going to do. Um, so now we are going to do uh, trial types uh, in this case. So let me kind of figure out. We're going to do new type in this case. Um, so now what we are gonna do, we're gonna select this. We're gonna have new type. So this is type B. Um, in this case, we are gonna pick the tone. And in this case, we are um, going to have none in this case. So um, yeah. So I was checking through the manual, making sure that everything is correct. So just to remind you what we're going to do with compound conditioning here, uh, what we are going to do is I am presenting a light and a tone paired with the shock. Uh, we are going to follow that up with type A, um, which is one trial of a light paired with nothing, and then type B, um, a tone paired with nothing. So now that we have everything good to go, we're going to go ahead and run that. Okay, so now let's kind of go and look through our data and see what's going on here. Um, so one of the things that you're gonna, oh, 
where did I go? Okay, so one of the things you're gonna kind of notice when you look at the movement ratio is that we do see a very, very strong um, acquisition between that compound stimulus and a shock. Now, what's kind of interesting is that when they are kind of paired on their own, that kind of drops off a bit. We see the movement ratio increase. So it seems to me that Snippy has kind of recognized that these both need to be paired together if they're going to produce a shock when they're each presented on their own, that doesn't really change much. So what's really critical here is that Sniffy has acquired a compound condition stimulus. When each of them are on their own, they do not function very well as a condition stimulus. And you can actually kind of see this if we kind of go into our mind window, you can kind of see that there is a little bit of a drop off. So here's our compound stimulus together. Um, and then you can kind of see that drop off there as well. So from page 56 in your manual, here's what they kind of say. Um, this mind window predicts that when each of the two component uh, condition stimuli is presented separately, which is what we did uh, during stage two, each component should produce a moderate movement ratio. The movement ratio results for stage two of the experiment confirm this prediction. When presented alone, both the light and tone elicit moderate, but not strong, conditioned responses. Um, in the example, the movement ratios for the light and the tones are not exactly the same. The difference is a matter of chance. If you perform the experiment repeatedly, the differences would eventually average out. So this is how compound conditioning works. So we can combine two separate stimuli and create a single conditioned stimulus with it um, that produces the greatest conditioning when both of them are presented together. And so now from that, I would kind of like to demonstrate a phenomenon known as the blocking effect. So uh, what we are going to do is we are going to uh, basically go back to um, our acquisition file for this. So I'm gonna go ahead and click save for our compound conditioning. Uh, your manual does have another one where you can actually do this for uh, separate pairings as a control condition so that you can compare the two. I'm not really gonna do that here, but I would like to show you a blocking effect. So I'm gonna go ahead and open a file. So I'm gonna save it. Now I'm going to go open up Sniffy Exercise 1, that original acquisition file. Oh, he's quite large. I'm kind of scared right now. Let's make him small. Let's make him a little smaller. Can I make you smaller? You're scaring me a little bit, buddy. Where are my other windows? Hey, where are my windows at? Okay. I Oh, there they are. Okay. Let's kind of move Sniffy over here. I don't know how he got so big. It's kind of scaring me a little bit. So... Uh, really quick, uh, one of the first things that your manual kind of recommends that you do uh, is just take a look at your classical conditioning experiment. Make sure that everything kind of fits here. So here, uh, blocking stage one. So we want uh, five minutes between trial types, present each trial 10 times. Our stimulus was a tone. Um, our stimulus was a tone. In this particular case, we had a medium intensity shock as our, um, as our second stimulus. So you need to make sure that you have that. So now what we're gonna do is we are going to do a save as. We are gonna call this Sniffy. What are you doing? Sniff, what is it doing? So I finally managed to get that to work. So we're going to go ahead, like I said, we're going to confirm uh, all of the original stuff from acquisition. This is technically our blocking stage one. So in this instance, we have basically already uh, had Sniffy acquire a tone as a condition stimulus. So now we're going to move into blocking stages two and three. And so here's what we're going to do. We're going to create a new stage. So now we have stage two. So stage two, what we are going to do, we have five minutes between trials. We're gonna do uh, each trial type 10 times. We are gonna do a compound stimulus in this particular instance. We're gonna do a medium intensity light and a medium intensity tone. In our second uh, stimulus, we're gonna use our medium intensity shock. 
Uh, so this is our second stage. So our first stage was one condition stimulus. That was our tone. Here we are pairing a light with a tone as well as a shock. And now we're going to create our blocking stage three. So here uh, we are going to do trial type A, which is where we are on. Uh, we're doing five minutes between trials. We're going to present each trial type once. Uh, in our first stimulus, we are going to do a medium intensity light. Uh, in the second stimulus, we're not going to pair it with anything. So then we're going to pick a new type. So this is type B for our stimulus. So this is still fitting. In our first stimulus, we are picking our medium intensity tone. Go back and make sure that type A, we check the light. We did. Um, so we're going to pick a tone. And again, we're going to pair that with nothing. Go back to type A, make sure we pair it with nothing. Um, so we have everything here. Um, and we're going to go ahead and click run. So let's go. Okay, so now we've got some data that's done. Let's go ahead and take a look at that movement ratio and see exactly what the blocking effect is. So here's something kind of interesting. So notice that my movement ratio for acquisition with the tone, here's stage one. So that was that ac initial acquisition. Notice too that when I present a compound stimulus, so both the light and the tone and the shock, um, this rate, this movement ratio is quite high. Here we have stage three. B was our tone. A was our light. For B, notice that um, our tone, our movement ratio is still quite high. Notice that that movement ratio plummets when we present the light. So this is kind of a demonstration of the blocking effect. If we want, we can go ahead and take a look at that CS response strength window. And you can actually notice that our response strength for the tone is quite high, but it's never really very high for the light, even when it's serving as a compound stimulus. So let's talk a little bit about what the blocking effect is and how it works. So um, during stage one, the 10 pairings of the tone with the shock caused the tone to acquire a large amount of response of condition stimulus response strength, which we actually see here. Thus, as the movement ratio shows, the tone was eliciting a strong fear conditioning response at the end of stage one. So then we have stage two. Because of the tone's response strength, uh, the light tone compound stimulus also elicited a strong conditioned response at the beginning of stage two. And it continued to elicit a strong movement ratio suppression throughout stage two. Um, so what we're kind of seeing here is that with a compound stimulus, because the tone already has such a strong condition response that carries over into the compound stimulus. So when the light and the tone are presented separately, as we saw with stage three, um, the results kind of show that when the tone is presented separately, the tone elicits a very strong conditioned response, whereas the light elicits little or no response. So what's basically going on here is that Sniffy has already made the connection that a tone is associated with a shock. When we pair a tone with a light and a shock, it's the tone. Sniffy's already had that pre-exposure to the tone, so Sniffy knows that it's the tone that's the thing and not the light. And so when we present each of those separately, the tone still gives a very strong effect, but the light really doesn't. And that's because the tone from the get-go has been associated with the shock, even when it was functioning as a compound stimulus. So. This is what the blocking effect is. You can kind of see this very well demonstrated in the movement ratio, and you can kind of see how the blocking effect works. So hopefully this was really good. The next time I might show a video about the overshadowing effect, as well as one of my favorite effects, the over expectation effect. And I will see you later. Have a great weekend.